Good morning, Year 10s. We are going to do the annotation of kamikaze as part of our work today. We've got two lessons um, today, and this is going to be the start of this one. As you can imagine, I am all prepared. I've got my markers, so that's my st structure, that's my tone. I'm not using green today at all, but you can if you wish, and I'll show you what, uh, what I mean. And I've got my soap aims, okay? So let's get started. Kamikaze, we look always, using the FOSS method, at the form and then the opening. So have a quick look through the form. We've read the poem yesterday, but if you look at the form, you can see that it's entirely created in stanzas of six lines, and there are seven of them. Okay? And you can say then, let's have a quick look. As we open the poem, we realize that we are looking at a poem which is unrhymed, six stanzas, uh, which is shows organized. It's not just randomly one long poem with no organization at all. It is in organized form but it's unrhymed, and the meter is uneven. So there's no iambic, trochaic, di di oh, I can't say it, diametric. There's nothing like that. The meter is just uneven speech, okay? There's nothing that we can say about that. So because you have this combination of the unrhymed and the no meter with this really organized six, um, six line stanzas, I better put six line stanzas, otherwise you're going to think I'm not very good at counting. Um, you've got this sort of combination of organized and not organized. So this sort of disorganized part here shows... Um, that this is a simple story, okay? It's very simple, there's no complicatedness, it's not a sonnet, it's simple, okay? So its simplicity is standing out to me. And I might decide that I would show that as a form, okay? It also shows that the mother, who's the storyteller here, um, who was the daughter and is now the mother. Um, the mother has revisited, I know I'm jumping ahead here before we get through the poem, but I want to cover all of the forms so we don't just keep jumping back and forth and you don't know what I'm doing. All right, so it shows here that the mother has potentially revisited this moment, the story moment, repeatedly, in her mind and this is why it is disorganized in its form okay so you've got this disorganization and organized at the same time okay so you've got the fact that she's revisited in her mind enough to organize her thoughts okay but not to organize it as something other than just a lot of her thoughts so it's disorganized from and organized in its message okay and the way that it's laid out really in stanzas okay so you've got now, this isn't a very complicated thing we've got to say about form here. If you consider the Charge of the Light Brigade that we've just been through, this is ridiculously simple, as most of the Charge of the Light Brigade was all about form and the way that the onomatopoeic form made us always just hear the horses. So we might not have a lot, according to the Foss Way structure, 
to say about form, but when we start with our argument, as soon as we jump in, we show that the form helps the argument. So this is where we're going to see whether the form helps the argument, okay, this interpretation part. So what do we look at first? The opening. And the very first thing we look at is the title. In Japanese, the word kamikaze means divine wind. That's what the actual expression means. And Japanese people are very religious, so immediately there is a question about whether the Japanese emperor believes that God is on their side. And when we say that, what we really mean is, are they right or are they wrong? Because that's what we're really interested in. When we say something about whether God approves or disapproves, what we really want to know is, is this the right thing to do? And so he is saying, this is the right thing to do. God approves. And these, using this Japanese word by Beatrice Garland, okay, immediately focuses our attention now this is all to do with our tone of the poem and our argument remember that's where we always have to start so we're using immediately the japanese word to confirm uh, as the title so when you use it as the title it focuses our attention on how the, the Eastern viewpoint, therefore Far East, might be different to our own Western viewpoint. Okay, and you must capitalize Eastern because we're not just talking about it being somewhere over there. We are talking about it being Eastern and therefore a big group of countries in the East and Western the same. OK, so we live in the West. Officially, they live in the East. All right. So we've now focused. We could talk about power of the emperor. We could talk about the power of the different government. So we've got the difference between East and West. And you've got one other idea which is the idea of a divine wind needs to be taken a bit further. Because a divine wind for the Japanese people was something that saved. So this is a gigantic irony using this word. We know that a kamikaze is a kind of, is a soldier, it's a suicide soldier, okay, that targeted uh, ships. OK, so we'll put that in just so we can't forget. In World War Two, we know that we've talked about that in the introduction. And yet it's a massive irony that they are called the name for the savior of the uh, Japanese people, because this, the reason why they call it a divine wind instead of just uh, a big wind is because they believed that when Kublai Khan was coming over to attack Japan, this giant, there were a series of two or three gigantic typhoons that stopped him being able to attack, dispersed his ships, and killed a lot of the, their enemies. And although you wouldn't assume something that was so destructive would be good, for them it saved their entire civilization. So it, the irony is that we are calling these saviors of destruction um, after the name... of a savior of, well, life and protection, okay? So that's a tremendous irony that the Japanese have chosen to do that as part of their, their war strategy and also the fact that they really do believe that God is on their side here. That's why they are saying we are acting in God's name here to do this. 
So when we talk about the false way, we start I, the idea about it being form, and then we go into the opening. What are we looking at next? We're looking at soap aims. But I'd really like to look at the opening stanza before we go into like a thousand soap aims. Okay, so let's read it. Her father embarked at sunrise with a flask of water, a samurai sword in the cockpit, a shaven head full of powerful incantations, and enough fuel for a one-way journey into history. Right, what have we got here? Giant list, okay? This is a structure. So we're kind of jumping a bit to structure before soap aims. All right, and I'm going to mark the commas. Okay, so it's giving me the idea that I'm the start of this story has a giant list. But even before then, we have the first line. Okay? So the listing. Okay, sorry about that. A lot of people just came into my office. Right, so we're just about to start on the very first line. It would be a serious mistake to avoid this. And if you do end up talking about this poem, this line makes a massive difference to the rest of the poem. We are looking at... Oops. We are looking at the fact that it's her father and that he embarked and that he embarked at sunrise. Three massive differences, okay? And then when we hit here, we have a change of tense. So we have, this is what he is doing, okay? And she's telling the story in the past tense, okay? But... Sorry, it's not a change of tense. It's a change of uh, focus. So this is the only part. There's the focus here. All right? This is what really happened. So the listing helps to make it very accurate. Okay? And it shows how single-minded he really was. Okay, because he's got all these things to go on this one way journey. And it's very accurate. So there's a real focus through the structure on what he is being willing to do and what he is doing. But this first line is really special. Her father embarked at sunrise. So here's the verb embarked. That's what he did. And not using the word left or anything like that. We're using the word embarked, which means, to, as we know, to start on a journey. Okay? And we're using transportation, as I said. Okay? And when we're using transportation, like a ship or a plane, this is a terrific irony that... Oh dear, I don't think this is going to be good. Right, we'll start again. That this verb, embarked, is to start on a journey using transportation methods like a ship or a plane. And it's a terrific irony that this is going to be to destroy ships. Okay, so this is being used, this bit of soap aims is the verb is an irony. Okay, so that's why it's so important that we start thinking about the opening. Now, when we look at the word idea of the sun and him leaving at sunrise, when we consider the idea of the sun, we think of the Japanese flag, which is the rising sun. That's the emblem of the Japanese flag. And it is actually a sign of happiness. Okay, which is another irony, really, as we've got the Japanese flag em emblem of the sun. It's the sign of happiness because for them, sun is a goddess, okay, and they worship um, the sun as a goddess, and for them, it's the sign of tremendous happiness. 
So he is going on a happy trip, which is terrifically ironic, as it's going to deal with death and a lot of death. Okay? You've got the irony using the verb embarked. Look at the pathos from saying that it's her father. Immediately, there is emotion. That's what pathos is, if you remember. So using this pronoun, which we don't go, oh, this pronoun says this, this verb does this, okay? We'll just say the pathos and the emotion that we feel when we say her father makes this a personal story where real people are being involved here. So it's not a made-up poem about somebody else. It's a personal story. Think about Remains, where he says that we, me and my mates, and we and I. It's very personal. It shows that people are being affected and hurt. All right, then we get this list. And once we've hit this really important part, we get this interesting list. And I don't want to focus on the whole list because the samurai sword tells us that he was a samurai. And that's important for us to know. The, fast, the fact that he's only got a flask of water, which means that he was fasting, which is part of their, uh, their code. So it shows that he is following the code. Yeah, he's got the flask of water and the shaven head. He is following the code of the samurai. He, they always take their swords with them. Okay. Following the code of the samurai. There's all a big list of the ways he is following this code. But when we hit down to what is... These are all physical things. So we've got this physical thing of fasting, the fact that he's carrying a sword around. That's what this list is doing. But we, she sh even shaved his head. But he's saying that the shaven head is full of powerful incantations. So the Japanese emperor, who's asked him to become a kamikaze pilot, is not just affecting... So these are the physical. And here is the mental. All right? And he's not just affecting the physical. All right? Having this mental change at the end is really, really powerful because he's changing this man's mind so he thinks it's okay to go and kill himself on purpose when normally you'd go into battle not to die yourself but to try and kill the others. All right? Which is already a bit messed up. So... Let's have a look at these adjectives here then, because uh, Beatrice Garland uses a lot of adjectives. And we're going to note the incantations, which are, we know, they're sort of a mental memorized spell or set of words. They have a negative from the spell and the witches, and the positive from them being going to help our, our minds and give us courage. So they have a negative and a positive implication. But here, the power is focused on. So this adjective of power is being focused on. And we are, her we are told that these are more powerful here than his own feelings. And I'm going to put... Oops, I can spell feelings, honestly. And I'm going to put this in orange. And I would suggest that the soap aim leads us to make a comment in orange, because the adjective is the soap aim. So here, we've got the physical and the mental both being affected, and this power is wielded by this Japanese uh, emperor that's, more, that's able to conquer this man's own feelings. Look at this adjective. So this adjective is here as well. And I really do not want, when you write um, your essays, to say this adjective, that adjective, that verb, finish. Okay? We want to talk about that irony, this listing, that simile, this use of the, the, the allusion, which is, this is allusion, I should really tell you. Um, that's bad teaching. Um, this allusion there to the Japanese flag. Oops, excuse me and the sun, 
All right, I really want you to look at those things first, but this adjective is very important, so we are allowed to, to talk about it. And here, I'm going to have to come down here to do my writing, the focus is on the fact that, that's not very well worded, I'm sorry, use your own words if you need to, that he will die if the emperor says so. Okay? As I said, that's not very well stated. All right, so the emperor is showing his power. But that's a better way of saying it, isn't it? The emperor here shows his power. He's showing it from the physical, he's showing it from the mental, and he's showing it in the fact that he's only provided enough fuel for the one-way journey into history, which we know is when he went to bomb. Now, that's an insane amount of annotation for the first section. You will be happy to know that it never happens again as far as we go through the poem. All right? So let's have a quick look at structure, because the next thing about after the soap aims is the structure. Let's have a read of the next three, whoop, the next three, we can almost get that in, um, lines, uh, stanzas, sorry, are we ready? So there's going to be a bit of moving around as I can get this all on the video. But halfway there, she thought, recounting it later to her children, he must have looked far down at the little fishing boats, strung out like bunting on a green-blue translucent sea. And beneath them, arcing in swathes like a huge flag, waved first one way, then the other, in a figure of eight, the dark shoals of fishes, flashing silver as their bellies swiveled towards the sun. And remembered how he and his brothers, waiting on the shore, built cairns of pearl-gray pebbles to see whose withstood longest the turbulent inrush of breakers, bringing their father's boat safe. And I'll just have to stop at safe because we could keep going. There's still not being the full stop and we are going to note that. So let's note this weirdness of the entire first page having no full stop at all. All right. First, we've got the fact that there is a lot of enjambment. Okay. And I'm just going to mark this one with it because it's everywhere. The enjambment is really helping with our idea here, okay? That, as I said, I would come back to it, that the mother is just going through this. She's partially organized it, but it's really this, that she's going through this in her mind, um, and she's trying to work out, it's almost, and I'm going to put that here, Right, that's not even an almost. Almost a stream of consciousness. And a stream of consciousness is a bit like um, a dramatic monologue where you're talking to yourself. But this is a slightly more organized dramatic monologue. I'll use the idea of it being a dramatic monologue, but I'll put it in commas so you know it's not really a dramatic monologue. Okay? Not really, but almost. Okay, and instead it's more like a stream of consciousness because she's gone from the very beginning saying that this happened and then she says she thought. The enjambment points toward this being a stream of consciousness. The fact that we have these little additions with the combination of the commas at, and this, which is a caesura, which is the random pause in the middle of a line. Okay, that one isn't, but that one is. The random pauses in the middle of the line focus our attention on these two words. And we then think, oh, this is her feelings. So everything from now is what she is interpreting. And that's really relevant. Very, very important. And it breaks it up. shows that she is really thinking 
the new details shows she's still working this out. Okay? Still going on. And it's very storytelly. Halfway there, she thought. And we'll get it again later on and we can link those two together. The storytelly things. And then we've got this, as we say, enjoyment. And I only want to say one thing about this is that there's a fab um, simile here, like bunting. And saying that the simile is really helpful, every single other candidate in this exam is going to say, oh, there's a simile. And I don't want you to say, oh, there's a simile and that's lovely. Okay? I want you to say, the simile shows at this point in her mother's thoughts that she is in a, in a way of celebrating... Remember, these are her interpretations of what he must have thought. Though, so he must be thinking that as a celebrating thing. Yeah, that he is going to be the focus of celebrating. So he's celebrating his sacrifice here. He starts out by celebrating his sacrifice. He's not thinking of anything else. He'll celebrate his bravery. But, as we know, nature steps in. So the next four stanzas, nature has stepped in. And we've got the adjectives. I'm just going to focus on one today. And I'd like you to say that she uses all of these bits of punctuation with the green-blue. Does she have to really say green-blue like that? No. That's, again, it is to break this, break up and slow down this thought process, the process. Honestly, my spelling today is terrible. Right, translucent, what can I say about that? That's ridiculous, it's another adjective. I don't want to start talking about every single adjective, but you are noticing that the adjectives in this poem are making a massive difference to how we annotate, okay? Translucent means clear. Let's make that clear from the start, ha ha ha. And the C is clear, therefore we get it almost, by the way, that's sensory language from our soap aims, not just adjectives, okay? And we get the, almost the feeling that nature, almost being personified here, almost, but we don't want to say it quite, because it's not quite, okay? Instead we'll say it, nature is clear, the C is clear, okay? And... His thought process starts to be mess, mixed up, which is a bit of an irony, because he's not clear anymore. He's not thinking clearly at all here. He's starting to see how beautiful nature is, and therefore he is potentially, we could say he is thinking more clearly, is he? We better ask that as a per, as orange question. Is he starting to see the reality more clearly? This is definitely an orange question, okay? To deal with the the questions that we're going to answer when we answer this uh, when we talk about this poem. And here we go. Here are some of the questions. So I'm going to say this is when the questioning starts. Okay, that's not very well spelled. That's not very well written. Sorry about that. We've got a super long way of writing this um, huge flag, waving first one way, then the other, in a figure of eight. The figure of eight is an illusion. Part of our soap aim, so it has to be blue. All right. But it's really slow, the way that he says it. So the structure of the illusion, it's kind of a pink point as well. All right. And we're using it as a simile as well because it's like a huge flag. So we're kind of simile and illusion mixed together here with a bit of structure. This is a great area to really focus your attention on in the exam because you say this is the start of the questioning 
and she uses the combination of illusion, giant long statement, um, what, the way of breaking it down by first one way, then the other, and really breaking it down. Okay? So he, she lengthens the simile and therefore the illusion and the images. Okay? Out. She lengthens it out. We could call this repeats, but it's not quite repeated, so I haven't said that. Um, why? Why is she making such a big deal? This figure of eight is an illusion of infinity. It's the symbol of infinity when it's written on its side. Okay? Sort of like that. Really. Okay, that's a symbol mathematical of infinity. infinity. It is also a sign of retreat and peace in war. So he is starting to see nature telling him through the fishes, okay, and the boats arcing like a huge fag, these fishes arcing, because it's not clear whether it's the boat string out on bunting, but it seems quite clear that the fishes and therefore nature, not man with the boats, which are celebrating, okay, so men celebrate while well, nature tells him, well, are we going to have more peace here? Shall we have some peace here? Question what you're being told by the emperor, okay? It symbolizes peace. So nature is symbolizing peace, okay? They're swiveling, which is a good word, is a verb. But we're not gonna. I'm not gonna overcomplicate it. Nature. These fishes are turning over as their bellies, and they're dark from their the backs of their their backs. So the fishes, and therefore nature, can change their minds. So nature has power to do that. But he doesn't, all right, because he's under the control of the emperor. Let's have a look. This is how he used to be. So he is rem she is putting a memory that was a real memory and saying he's questioned potentially by looking at the fish. He's questioned potentially by remembering how previously he might have behaved. And there's a real focus on he and his brothers, it slows it down. Who cares if it was he and his brothers? We're talking about him, but it's really relevant here, okay? Because it shows that he was not the eldest brother because the oldest was the heir to the father and therefore the heir could not commit suicide on behalf of the country unless it was absolutely necessary. So we're saying here, he's not the oldest. So there's he's questioning here, at this point, fairness. Why is it fair that I have to die? My brother doesn't. Everything about this is all questions. Nature can change their minds. In man's version of nature, he's not allowed. Okay? And they build these cairns of pearl gray pebbles. We know a cairn is used to show direction. The pearl gray adds, remember it's that bit of structure there, but it adds a sense of value because we say pearls are very valuable, okay? So there's a value in these cairns. And what are they doing? The cairns are bringing their father's boat safely home, okay? So there's an irony here, a massive one, that the, these brothers, it's not fair, and they spent their whole lives building these cairns, which were a value to them to save their own father's boat to come home. And I'm going to put, even though we haven't seen it yet, repetition of safe, because on the next page you'll see, okay? And repetition is a structure. It's not a soap aim. It's a structure, just like listing, all right? Why is this ir ironic? Because they're showing nature being dangerous,
and man trying to win it over nature, yes? And there's a real focus on safety. That's why we're bringing up the repetition here. However, the irony is that in this situation, nature shows safety with the fishes, with the retreat and the symbol of eight, saying, you will live forever. Do not um, kill yourself because be peaceful. It is a sign of peace. So in this, nature is showing safety and peace. And it's men who are at war. And all of nature is causing him to question human nature, the nature of, of humans is all being questioned. Now, when we move on to our second page, you will see the repetition of safe. And I'll just mark it here. And it's not just safe. It's safe with this in the middle. Okay. And this is another aside. Just like the other one, which was she thought. Okay, so she's really, she's struggling with, oops, you can't see a thing I'm writing. She is struggling with what has happened. Because she's not saying it as a nice, long, beautiful stream. She's interrupting herself. Yep. So the fact that she's interrupting her own thoughts shows she's jumping all over the place. And this is important. The safety aspect, again, is repeated. It's important. Then we get some lovely alliteration, which is supposed to be blue for me. And it slows us down big time because we're getting the alliteration with safe. So not only the repetition of safe, we have the alliteration pointing us at safe. So, what have we got here? Has he gone through a little argument with himself and said, well, all of nature can change their mind. Why do I have to do what the emperor says? Um, my brothers haven't had to do it. I used to spend all my time trying to keep my father's boat out safe. And the irony is I'm going to go and destroy a lot of boats which were safe before and, and are now going to be in dangerous. Okay? So here... Big important orange point, okay? I'm just going to orange that in a second. She is focusing here on his thinking because she's having to make it up as she has never asked him and that's really sad and we'll talk about that in a sec. Okay. Leading to his thoughts... Okay, so his thinking is leading to his thoughts, that's badly said, but never mind, of danger. All right, so he didn't think about danger in the beginning, he was celebrating. So now we have, uh, we'll just do a little diagram so we remember what we meant because of Mrs. Bad um, annotations. So we've moved from celebrating to danger in one little section. And... The danger is emphasized in this line. Now, everybody and their mother is going to start looking at this line. But you are going to do so for a different reason. You're going to point out the fact that she's starting to list again. All right? And when she lists, it starts to slow down. All right? From, from the, using the listing, it really slows us down. And it focuses us on every single word. And the last word is dangerous. Okay? And now you see my point. It's focusing us on danger. Everything is saying, actually, turn back, turn back, turn back. What you're doing is stupid and it's dangerous. Okay? You're saying the dark prince, who is a metaphor. Because it's not really a dark prince, is he? He's a fish. So he is not the dark prince. It's a metaphor for the emperor. So basically this last line we are going to say not oh we love the we love the metaphor of the danger of the tuna and the fishes are danger nature is dangerous. We're going to say that using this listing 
and the metaphor for, and the fact that dangerous is the last word. So three techniques, all for the price of one, is there is a focus on the final conclusion to his thoughts, full stop. That following the emperor is dangerous. Now let's see whether that turns out to be true. Okay? Okay. Right. Let's do this last bit quickly because it's already late. And though he never came, though he came back, my mother never spoke again in his presence. Nor did she meet his eyes. And the neighbors too. They treated him. I'm going to do the two. As though he no longer existed. Only we children still chattered and laughed. Till gradually we too learned to be silent. To live as though he had never returned. That this was no longer the father we loved. Full stop. And sometimes she said another aside. He must have wondered which had been the better way to die. You can see with my emphatic circling exactly where I'm going with this, okay? Okay, so nature. Nature says, turn back, it's too dangerous. Following men's ideas is dangerous. Think about yourself. Think about your instincts as a person. You saved your father. You worried about your father. Are you really going to do this to other people's husbands and fathers? Okay, and now... There's this process of this mother, or the, who is now a mother. We're back to her being a mother. She stopped imagining. This is exactly factual. No imagining now. It's a change. Okay? We've got... Um, this factual account of all the problems... Turning back caused him and their family. All right. So we've got three. It's affected his, her mother and the neighbors and the kids. Okay. And in the end, well, there's four then. Himself. He has questioned two. Everybody else is questioning him, and now he's questioning himself at the end after this giant full stop. Because obviously in this one, the full stops are big time. There are only three of them. So we've got a very slowing down here. We've got, think my mother never spoke, nor did she meet his eyes. And the neighbors too, comma, they treated him as though he no longer existed. Okay. And there are a lot of commas to live as though he'd never returned, that this was no longer the father that we loved. All of this caesura slows us down, focuses attention on the consequences. She's very unhappy about these consequences. And therefore, we've got a very negative semantic field. And I'm going to do this in orange because I think that's really showing our argument. We've got the never, the nor, the no, okay? The never, the no. And we've got this really negative semantic field. So we've got this seriously negative semantic field pointing to only negative consequences. Now, you would think that their father returning home, not having killed a lot of people, and not having died himself would be a positive for celebration. But actually, this jerky pattern of caesura, which is very jerky, slow down, we slow down. Slow down, okay? She is uncomfortable with these, these, uh, con this negative situation. So the negativity plus this caesura, she is uncomfortable. I better put she is uncomfortable with 
this negative conclusion. I see no other conclusion we can draw. She's clearly not happy. Otherwise, she wouldn't have such a jerky way of... She would be very happy, and it would be a happy set semantic field. Okay, so it's a jerky pattern showing she's really uncomfortable. Let's look at the focus of the, the, the full stops then. The dangerous... The fact that it's dangerous to follow the emperor. Then we've got we loved. So I'm just going to use pink because it's the last ones before these full stops, yeah? And then we have to die. All right? Oh, I've lost my pen. So we've got a focus here on a very, very... Now, remember, they're not an oxymoron. It's a juxtaposition in two or three lines of the fact that she loves her father, but staying alive did not improve his life or that of his family. Negative semantic field does that. The nasty pink, um, jerky, uncomfortable caesura does that. And the juxtaposition of the loved and the die really, really closely together. Okay? I mean, realistically, let's have a look at this last line before we finish. And we're going to look at it in blue, all right? The better way to die. Is there a good way to die? Is there really? So, it's not. There are no good ways to die, okay? So, this is an oxymoron of their opposites at the end. This is the ending of the poem, okay? So, when we consider the ending... We are considering it in a very messed up state of mind. She's very uncomfortable with what she did to her father. She's uncomfortable that her mother was mean to him. The neighbors were nasty to him and the kids were nasty to him. And I'll focus, we'll go back to the kids in a second, right before we finish. But this oxymoron um, and therefore the juxtaposition of opposites, it's rather an irony. There is no good way to die. But it's an, rather an irony. Oops, oops, I'm going to get a real close for my legs in a second. Um, it's a real irony that you, you've you got the fact that it, nothing was solved here. His life is not improved by coming home. He came home to see his children because all of nature was saying, come home, come home, come home. And there's an all, the, and though he came back, mixes with better way to die, the poor man. Therefore, the tone here, I better write this in, okay? The tone here are negatives about people and what they do to him, and the positives are about nature. Nature is always good and lovely and wonderful, all right, so we could really use this against exposure, which shows that nature is not always wonderful and good, and neither are people. But let's look at this. This is really the last thing I want to say. The kids acted, they still chatted and laughed, till gradually we too learned. There's a real focus on the two. And when you focus on that, you're kind of joining it up and saying, the kids were naturally, okay, there's the show of nature. They naturally did that because they were happy that their dad was home. However, they learned, okay? And that's really, really sad that actually she is causing her, this causes her to reflect. So this is a poem about reflecting on what you could do better. All right. She learned. Causes her to reflect on her reasons for what she did. Which was to avoid him and never really speak to him again. And it's super sad that she's having to imagine why he turned back because she never spoke to him either.
She never spoke to him about it. She's having to imagine it. We'll put that at the top. Has to imagine it. Can you see that? No, you can't. She has to imagine the story. She never asked him. And why? Why does she have to imagine the story? Why did she never ask him? She is unhappy with her memories about everything. But why is she so unhappy with her memories of this event, which should have been a really happy event? She is unhappy because she allowed... her culture to determine her actions. Oh my goodness, we could combine this with almost any poem now. We could talk about the war photographer. We could talk about bayonet charge, about how they had to go to battle. Okay, she is unhappy, war has hurt her, but more than that, her memories of what she did because of her culture have upset her. And this is a sad poem, thus the start of Kamikaze, with a sad name. Right, finish your annotations, color code them gorgeously, and I will see you in the Zoom meeting at 11 o'clock.